Uh, so I just want to say hi to everyone. I see the number of people joining. It's increasing by the minute, which is really great. My name is Domiziano Francescon. I am the co-chair of the communications team of Research for Life. And I'll just be making a short introduction on the scope, the mission of Research for Life, and a bit about the eligibility criteria for countries and institutions. And after that, I will leave the floor to the real experts, my colleagues, Maria Falk and Lenny Ryan, because they will be the ones who will really explain to you everything that you need to know about how to join Research for Life and how to make the best um, out of the really large offering that we have within the partnerships. So in this, on the screen, you can see a bit about the agenda. Um, and as I mentioned, you can find these slides on our website afterwards. So first of all, um, where to find us? On the screen, you can see the link to the Research for Life website. I'm sure um, all of you on the call are familiar with that. And on the website, you can find all the information you need about Research for Life. And what is important is that you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And that's a really good way to stay in touch because if you follow us there, you can make sure that you're up to date with all the latest news. Um, and <clears throat> as you can see on the screen, we also have a newsletter. It goes out every month. Um, so that is also a good way to um, really know what the latest updates are. We have also a dedicated user forum through dgroups. The link is there. And what, uh, on dgroups, you will be able to connect with more than 15,000 users around the world. So that is a really good place for you to go join, follow the discussions um, and find us other users of Research for Life. You can see the link there, but I will also put all the links in the chat so that's easier to find. So what is really Research for Life? Research for Life is um, a very unique public pub private partnerships. It's between the UN agencies, universities and around 180 publishers. And the goal of Research for Life, it's really to reduce the knowledge gap. We want to stimulate really effective research. We want to promote international collaboration. And we've been doing this since 2002. And you can see there that we have really a lot of material available throughout the partnerships. And we reach around 10,000 institutions in 125 countries. So that's, you know, a really a lot of institutions, a lot of libraries, a um, lot of government organizations. And, you know, we offer up to 120,000 scientific and professional journals, books, and other databases. And all the research that I've mentioned are the resources are available to five dedicated programs. You can see them on the screen. Perhaps you are familiar with some of them. Each of the program is managed by a different United Nations agency. And each program also focuses on different research topics. So we have Hinari for Health, Agora for Agriculture, Oare for the Environment, Ardi looks at technology and innovation, and Guale looks at law and social sciences. And if you go on our website, you can find more about the specific programs. We have lots of training material that can help you really better understand the programs, the resources. And I know that Lenny will talk, you, um, will talk to you a bit more about this later in the presentation on where to find specific training material on our website. Going to eligibility, which is the last topic that I will cover in this very general presentation, um, I want to mention that local and non for profit institutions from two list of countries, areas and territories that we call them Group A and Group B, those are eligible to join Research for Life. And you can see on the screen a map of the eligible countries. Um, and of course, you can find a full list of the countries and criteria on our website. The main difference between Group A countries and Group A countries, as you can see on the slide, is that Group A countries have free access to all the resources in Visit for Life, while Group B countries do have to pay um, $1,500 uh, per year to access Visit for Life. And you know, I just mentioned group A and group B countries. So how the countries are divided. 
we have different criteria, we follow different factors, and these factors are taken into account to define which country is assigned to which group. You can see on the screen, this is maybe a bit too technical, but it's important to know that the eligibility of countries is assessed once per year, and it depends on the different factors. For example, we look at gross national income, the United Nations list of least developed countries, human development indexes, and you can find links to all these criteria on the very important page that it's there at the bottom of the screen, the eligibility page, which is really the main section of our website where you can go and find out more about how the eligibility works and how to be eligible. And then finally, within the countries, the group A and group B countries that I mentioned, who can get access to Reset for Life? So if you work or you are a part of an institution that is academic, it's government, it's a research institution in a lower middle income country, you might be eligible to join Research for Life. And on the screen, you can see the list of the types of institutions. And as always, more information is available on our website. Um, and you know, I know that my colleague Maria later in the presentation will also talk about how to reach out to the Research for Life help desk if you have more questions about how eligibility works and you want to support. So with that, I'm just gonna close my short introduction. I will put some links in the chat and do keep posting your questions there because I can moderate the chat and then send questions to Lenny and Maria who will be able to hopefully answer them. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that um, Lenny or Maria, you wanna share yours, is that okay? Hi, Lenny or Maria, do you want to share your screen? I think Maria is doing it. Okay, great. Yeah. Perfect. She has the bulk of the presentation here. <laughs> Maria, you need to unmute. Uh, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> So let's let's uh, start uh, telling you how to reach Research for Life. In the in our web page, um, I, I strongly recommend you to visit it because it's very complete. Uh, there is a step by step guide on how to to register. Um, and also the registration form. Uh, please remember that individuals are not eligible to register, only institutions are. Um, but uh, we, we normally prefer that libraries register the institutions, but it's not necessary. You can register your institution even if you are not the librarian or the director, which normally are our main contacts. Um, as I said, the registration form is available at the Research for Life web. And if you are going to register an academic institution, uh, please check before that your institution is not already registered. There is, we published a list of academic institutions uh, already registered. The registration request arrives to us and uh, if it's okay, the registrant will receive uh, an email communicating that it had, that the institution has been accepted and the details have been sent to the director and the librarian. If you register your institution and you are not the director or the librarian, please warn them because they are going to receive the, the information uh, from us. The information they are going to receive from us is what we call the welcome message. Once the request is validated and eventually approved, if, if the, the registration request is not complete or we need 
we think that we need more information, we will communicate with the registrant asking for, for it. Um, director and librarian will receive the welcome message uh, that we send in English, French, or Spanish. And the welcome message contains um, the username and password, instructions about how to access, and the license agreement. The, uh, the license agreement is only in English, and it contains the terms and conditions about, about, about the access. Um, we ask uh, our contacts in the institution, always librarian and direct, to read it carefully and to sign it and send it back to us. The, the license um, has uh, the, the usage policy. I mean, signing it, the institution um, commits to, to, to follow this, this policy. Uh, everybody can see it. It's in our frequent asked questions in the, in the web. You can, you can read the, the license agreement. And it's as the list of eligible countries, as Mitziana mentioned before. Also, the, the license agreement is revised every year by the publisher partners. And sometimes some terms change. For example, last year, the partners included the possibility of accessing research for life from another country in under certain conditions. Uh, you can see there the piece of, of license uh, talking about it. And uh, I, I don't know if I said it before, the, the license is an agreement between the institutions and the publishers. Uh, and you can, you can check it in the, in the web. So uh, the, there are two ways uh, to access our content. One is through institutional login credentials like um, writing username and password in our login page. And there is another one, which is uh, accessing through IP address. Mm, to do that, we need the institutions to register their fixed IP addresses or address in the IP registry, which is the institution we refer to uh, to confirm that those IP addresses are from the institution. And once the institution registered their IP addresses in the IP registry, ju they just need to communicate it to us and we upload the addresses in our system. And from that very moment, uh, the users connect it to a computer in the network of the institution can access directly without need to write username and password. Recently, we implemented a new feature, feature uh, that we call persistent login. And uh, it provides three months of recognition of a device that, uh, that, is, that has been connected to, a, to, a, to research for life from an approved IP address, it means. I am in my campus, I access to research for life through IP, then I go home and during three months I can access without need to know or to write the username and password and without need of VPN or proxy or whatever. There is also the possibility for the user to clear the cookies and the persistent login is is lost. We informed all our librarians about this new this new thing that we are always trying to help users to access. We know these are difficult times, so we hope that this is helping you to access when the access from the campus or from the institution is not possible. So 
how to get help from us, from the Research for Life help desk. Uh, you can just send an email to the address you can see in the slide, uh, but we need you to give us information. We need you to tell us where are you writing from, the institution name and the country. If your username and password are not working or you are having problems with them, we need to know which username and password are giving you problems. Uh, please don't ask the Research for Life. If you are an end user, if you are not a librarian, Please don't. Yeah, Could you please mute yourself? Ah, Thanks. oh, my baby. Thank you. So if you are an end user, if you are not the librarian or the director or an official Research for Life contact, don't ask us for your password because we are not going to send end users the password. We I... only send that kind of information to librarians and directors that are our official contacts. And if your problem, give us the, the a lot of details about the problem you are having. Are you able to log on or you get a failure to authenticate or you are able to log on, but you are unable to access certain journal or you can access a journal, but you cannot access that issue that you need to access. And, uh, and according to the Research for Life uh, portal of the program you are using, you should have access to to that journal, and if you if you include uh, screenshots of the error message you are receiving, or or of the journal or the issue or the article asking for a for another login or whatever, if you include um, screenshots including the URL, uh, it will help us a lot to help you. So these are real samples of emails that we receive often in the help desk. As you can see, it's very difficult for us to help directly those users. We need to know much more things to be able to give uh, an answer to make things work. So I, I copied here a couple of perfect emails, they are real also, I, I removed the, the information. So as, as I was saying before, we, we need to know the institution name, we need to know the country. I, it, it could seem too much institution name and country, but if you tell us that you are writing us from the, the Ministry of Agriculture and you don't tell us the country, we have 100 ministries of agriculture in Research for Life. So institutional name, country, username, password, and the kind of problem you have, the kind of error message you receive, and the screenshot, of course. In this case, this is an email from an institution that couldn't access a concrete issue, a concrete issue of a concrete journal and they sent us all the information. We need this information because we need to replicate the problem to see where the problem is. So, so please don't hesitate to contact the Research for Life help desk every time when you need our help, every time you have a doubt, every time you need more information, but please also help us to help you. And I pass to Lenny. Lenny? Yep. Maria, do you just want to go through the slides? Because. Uh, ah, okay. Yeah, it'll take okay. me more time to okay. log in. Okay, so one issue that comes up all the time that I wanted to talk about, there are many issues I'd love to talk about is the fact that the publishers have the option of granting access or not 
on a country and even on a country and institution type, uh, what kind of organization you are level. So you are in Research for Life and you think you have access and you don't have access and you really wanna know what publishers and what resources you have. Okay, and this is very critical for the uh, for the researchers and students that are using the uh, resource. So we have opened up the eligibility page and scroll down to the bottom and you see content offered by publishers to institutions, categories within countries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have clicked on Hanari. We have opened up Ethiopia and we have opened up university and faculty. And then you get the number of subscription-based journals you have and the number of eBooks that you have, and you get a list of all the publishers on the, it scrolls down. So that is one way of finding out which publishers you will have granted access in your country or not. Next slide. Did I lose my, uh... Maria, can you go to the next slide? I guess I need to. I went to next slide. Okay, we're good. So I'm sorry, the, uh, it just was a bit delayed. Uh, the publisher, another way of finding out what publishers grant access or not is after you log in. And again, we're logged in as Ethiopia, Ethiopia University Faculty College. And there are two sections in this list that give you, you have full access to, and you do not have full access to. Okay, and then to click to see the individual books and journals, you would click on the publisher's title. So in this case, you'll, you'll see a fairly long list of publishers that have granted access, but at the bottom is a very short list of, in this case, one, two, three, four, five publishers, because there's two for Elsevier, that do not grant access in Ethiopia. So this is another way of finding out what you are able to access and what has not been granted in your country. Now, I would like to mention, and maybe I should have put in a slide, if you go to the home page of any of the programs, you log in, you go to the content home page, you will see the bo search box. That search box is, we call it the summon search box because it uses the summon architecture, the summon tools. If you do a search there, you will get access to only the material that is available in your country. So that is another way of dealing with this problem. It may be a little frustrating, say, if you don't see uh, publications, articles from this publisher or that publisher, but it is granting access to what you can uh, reach uh, through, the, through the portal. So you will see uh, the title and the abstract, and you'll see a link to the full text. So that's another important thing. Can we go to the next slide? I have a little more to talk about this. Okay, so we are again in Ethiopia University Faculty and College, and one of the publishers that grants access is Carger. So we've clicked on Carger, and you see that it's showing you that you have on type 120 journals, no books, in the uh, default accessible content list, you see the green boxes. That means that if you were to go in and try to open a journal and were asked to pay or said you're told you do not have access, that is when you contact the help desk with all the information, with the screen capture, et cetera. Then below that, we've gone to publisher that does not grant access. We have opened the all items list and that's where you'll see the dreaded gray box with the ex exclamation point, which means you do not have access to this journal. And in this case, it is a significant number of journals for this publisher. Next slide, please. If there are questions on that, we'll get back to them. 
Okay. Here we are. We have gone to the research for life. We have gone to the research for life training portal. Okay, and the reason we want to do this, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the resources we have that are useful to you. Uh, one is the first one has a couple good presentations, getting started with research for life that you could uh, use when talking to faculty or administration. Uh, are people aware of our Research for Life MOOC? I can't tell you, but we will, we have uh, trained literally several thousand users through this MOOC. We will be giving it twice in 2021 and all the material is up to date and we really try to reach the users through this. The third one is uh, webinars, and this is an example of a webinar, and this is where you will find the recording. Besides, I saw Domitiana said she will be sending that information to you. And notice there are some are about resources from publishers, dimensions, uh, Embase, and then the others are more informational like this. There is one about searching with Summon and Google Scholar. And then there is one for the people in health and updated webinar on the, on the new version of PubMed. Uh, we've also highlighted in resources for related organizations and publishers. We've highlighted some uh, material that we find is very valuable to uh, broaden your knowledge, enhance your skills. Okay, uh, author skills, the fifth one there, uh, obviously deals with how to publish and gives you an overview of how to read and write a scientific paper, intellectual property, strategies for executive writing, and also talks about how to use Mendeley and Zotero, reference management tools. Uh, the final one, and I'm gonna spend a little more time is resources for librarians and information specialists. And I want to note that, and maybe we should just go to the next slide. Okay, I have about three more slides. So here's the URL to that page, resources for librarians and information specialists. Notice, first thing is train the trainer, learn all about using research for life. And what that does is gives you up-to-date PowerPoints that parallel the material in the MOOC and that you can use there. Uh, I will go on to that in a, the next slide. And then we'll also talk a little about advocacy toolkit. But I only want to speak for a few more minutes so we can start having a discussion and answer your question. Next slide, please. Okay, this is an overview of the first page of the material for trainers. And note that we have five different topics. Most of this material is interdisciplinary. Okay, so we're trying to reach people who use all five programs. And there's a little background with the scholarly communication research for life. Then we have more on scholarly literature. Then we have topic three is discipline specific. Topic four, uh, branches out to additional discipline-specific material that can either be... Ooh, there we go. Either be in the program itself, Hanari or Hawari or Kowali, or it can be on the internet. And the last topic is Research for Life for Advocacy Toolkit and also tra uh, training audience on how to use Research for Life. So we can go on to the next slide. I just want to briefly show you, this is really the work of the comms committee and Domitiana, and there is a wonderful advocacy toolkit with a presentation and a, and a fact sheet, and it helps you promote your library within your institution, promote your resources, learn how to be an advocate for the program. Originally, this was set up for to help group B People in Group B countries uh, discuss the funding with their and get the funding with their administrators, but we realize it's also very useful 
for other libraries to go through this so that you can better integrate the resources and the programs and what your library can do with the key groups at your institution. Now, finally, we have one more. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, no, I'm sorry. There's also a page with marketing material, which is very helpful if you're doing a presentation or if you're doing training, and here's the link to that page. Uh, I know the comm staff spend a reasonable amount of time trying to keep this material up to date, and it is in numerous languages. So take a look at this. And then there's one last one, I think. Yes. Uh, if you are interested in promote using the material and getting to user groups, there is a link to a marketing plan. It's really a spreadsheet if you download it. And then you can list your client groups horizontally and scroll down and add, answer the questions and develop a plan to see what material each group needs, which material uh, is available through Research for Life, where other material is on the internet, how to develop a survey. So if you're a librarian and you're trying to think, how can I get all my groups to use this material better? Please look at this. Client groups obviously would be groups like uh, faculty, researchers, postgraduate students who have research projects, uh, research staff, et cetera. I think that's it for me. Uh, I think we can open it up now and we have a good amount of time for questions. So I'm going to now sign off and open my video so you can see. Do we have questions in the chat? How are we going to handle this? Um, so I was having a look at the chat and right now I don't really see any question that you have not um, covered already. A lot of questions about the presentation. I want to reiterate once again that yes, the webinar is recorded. The presentation will be up on the Reset for Life website. Uh, that seems like the number one um, question that we got, but okay. I'm also checking if there's- I see one about author skills model training. Now, what we have on that page are tools for you to use and material to look at, and it's kind of self-paced. We do not per se have an author skills training uh, activity, but what you will see in that is a link to author aid, A-U-T-H, or oh, maybe I can put this in the chat. Okay, sorry about seeing my hand type. Okay, authorade.info. That is a huge project by INESP, and it has a number of courses and resources and mentorship. So if you're really interested in uh, information and courses about author skills, I suggest looking at this. I suggest looking at some of the other resources that we list. Okay. Uh, actually, there is a task force looking at the role of Research for Life in dealing with uh, the whole area of publishing. And I'm on the yeah, task force, yeah. and so is someone from comms, Elisa. And we're preliminarily trying to write uh, terms of reference and then come up with some strategies. And one may be to make, to figure out ways to tell the research for life community about these resources and organize that better. I hope that answers your question. What can we do if we want to access the content from a publisher that does not provide? Okay, for example, uh, we really need Elsevier, Emerald, Sage, and Springer. Uh, sometimes I feel I'm not the right person to answer this question uh it's it's a very difficult task uh we understand why when the publishers have the have the right to choose to not 
for grant access or grant access. And uh, maybe, Kim, you're on. Maybe you could add a little to this discussion. Maria's got her hand up, yeah. so I'm going to defer yes. to them. Yeah, I, I think I can. Uh, it, it's it, it's difficult to explain uh, exclusions, why uh, publishers decide to remove access from particular countries or type of institutions. But we need to understand that uh, we are in a partnership with publishers and they offer for free their content, which is very expensive. And we work to achieve the best compromise possible, but one of the conditions of Research for Life are publishers have the right to protect their existing business. So if they think that in a country they have significant sales, they take the difficult decision uh, of excluding that country. If one institution needs access to those uh, contents. Uh, we, we strongly, uh, our advice is to contact directly the, the publisher and try to get uh, an agreement with them on how to, to get the access. But uh, remember that they are offering free access and Remember also that it's not on us; it's the uh, it's the publishers who make the difficult decision uh, to give or not access to the to the to the countries or to the type of institutions. Before we go to other questions, I've seen uh, before a comment from a person from Lebanon, and I want to take the opportunity to uh, ask him or her to contact us. Uh, Lebanon will get access, will get, uh, is, is, will be eligible starting January next year. Uh, please contact us and we will tell you how to do and please uh, inform other institutions from Lebanon that they, we, we have tried to contact all our contacts in the country but please inform other institutions from your country and ask them to contact us. Thanks. Oh, we have a whole list of questions now about a librarian does want, no, not want to give the password out when we do it. And uh, we, when I did training and I think Maria would agree, we encourage the password to be given out to you uh, to the users. And I know that sometimes there are institutions that are more cautious. Uh, they may have the, uh, use the auto login, I don't know. But from our position is, if you are in one of the groups that has access at your institution, you should be able to have the username and password. There was another related question about working off campus. And yes, if you have your username and password, you can work at off campus. And that's even more critical in this day of the pandemic with some campuses being closed. I hope that answers that question. Uh, there's one about research of life, giving assistance to upcoming publishers. Uh, we are really, predominantly in the information access business. But as I said, we have that whole section in the training portal about author skills just to help people along. Uh, I, again, would refer you to the author aid site because it has a whole host of resources, including mentorships for people who are developing research projects and writing articles. So that may be the best source. Uh, as I say, we're trying to sort out our own level of responsibility with this issue. And quite possibly we'll be adding to the MOOC uh, a lesson on uh, dealing with publishing and author skills, but we are not physically holding separate courses. Uh, I would like to add, uh, sorry, I would, I would like 
like to add something to your answer, Lenny. Mm -hmm. uh, Research for Life focuses on getting access to content. Unfortunately, we don't have funds to funds to assist with uh, publishing fees and things like that. So we are very sorry. We receive a lot of requests, but we cannot help you with uh, publishing fees. Sorry. Although I, I also want to mention on that note, Maria, that a lot of publishers do offer waivers to um, authors who come from Research for Life yeah. countries. So yeah. I invite everyone to, if you want to publish with a specific partner, um, go check the publisher website and ask them if they have waivers so that you don't have maybe to pay the full price, you pay half of it. Sometimes there are information on publisher website. So just as a note. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Maria, there's a question there for you in the help desk. We are working in a division under the department and we do not know who the administrator for Research for Life is. Therefore, we have problems of logging in to get access to resources. <coughs> so that's, that's a help that's, desk question. That's easy. Contact the help desk. No, send us the, yeah, send us the, the write an email to the help desk with the name of the institution and so on. And we will try to put you in contact with the with our contacts in your in your institution. Okay, there was an earlier question about gold and green standards and embargo, and I think that has to do with publishers, open access publishers, and the level of access a publisher is granting. Gold would be that everyone immediately gets access to the articles. I forget exactly what green is. And an embargo would be a publisher who says, you have open access, but after six months or after a year. So I hope that helps. Uh, the, I hope that answers that question briefly. We have one about, it's possible to add on the information of Research for Life for subjects on gender, accounting. Uh, green, thank you, Kim means that you have the right to put your article in institutional repository for green. Thank you, Kim. Uh, is it possible to add on information of research for life for subjects on gender and accounting? Uh, I defer on that one because I, maybe Kim knows more about how the subjects are organized and possibility of adding a new one, although if you go in and do a sum and search, you could add gender issues as part of your search. Uh, the question about accounting, I know you're looking perhaps for a list of accounting journals, but I find that we have five programs, but it's uh, which are about agriculture, environment, et cetera, uh, health, but I find that if you do a sum and search, you're searching across the material from all the, all the different programs automatically, even if you're in Hanari or in Awari or in Gowali, you're searching across all of them. And you can do social science searches and get excellent results. So you could probably do accounting searches and get uh, accounting topics and good results. I have an example where I did a search on, let me remember, uh, universities and distance learning. And immediately 31,000 articles and book chapters came up. So I think that's one way of getting around uh, the issue of not having a subject for say, a subject specific list for accounting. Uh, Let's see, there it is. There are a lot of counting titles uh, in Research for Life. Okay, thank you, Kim. As a researcher, um, go ahead, Maria, if there's another yeah, one. Yeah, that one, I was going to answer to that one. We, uh, Research for Life doesn't publish uh, a journal or articles. We just give you access to existing content. So unfortunately, we cannot uh, publish uh, articles from users. 
uh, again, we we suggest you to contact the publisher to try to publish your article. Okay, we have uh, please more questions. A couple thanks to us, but we're trying to see if there are other issues we could answer here. Thanks for the answer. Kimberly, is there anything you'd like to add to our discussion, some points that we may have missed? You did very well. I'm not going to interfere. <laughs> <laughs> That's the program manager of Inari. Thank you very much. <laughs> I would like, because I think I forgot it before, when uh, we were talking about the registration form, uh, again, like, for asking for help to the help desk, the more information you give, the quicker the thing will go. So please avoid acronyms, put the, the full name of the institution. And one very important thing that I didn't mention, we need at least two different contacts, librarian and director, two different names with different email addresses. If you send us a registration request with only one email address or only one name, we, we then will need to contact you to get the information and things uh, get longer. So also when, when filling the registration form, please give us uh, a lot of information so things go quicker. Oh, there's a question for you. Can't we have access before January for Lebanon? <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. It, it will start in January, but uh, you can contact us before and we can start uh, doing things. But the access will start in January, Kim? Yeah, maybe I can explain why. Um, because when we add a new country, in order for it all to work properly. The publishers have to make changes in their system to turn on the access for that country. And we have to establish everything in our side so that we handshake with the publishers properly. So um, even if we wanted to, unfortunately, we couldn't make all of that happen <laughs> much faster than we are currently doing. Okay, there's a question about, is it possible for me to publish in Research for Life in librarianship? And uh, if you're publishing, if you're able to get a journal article accepted in one of the publishers that is participating in Research for Life, indeed, in that way, you would be publishing in Research for Life, but it really is up to the individual publishers. Uh, Cost implications, do authors have waivers? We've mentioned that a bit. You have to talk with the individual, see what the individual publisher does in terms of granting waivers. Some are more generous than others. Uh, again, we see these kinds of questions in discussions like this, when we have MOOC webinars, when we do master trainer virtual courses, and that's why we're trying to get a better handle on some of these key questions and see what, where we can direct people to get better information. But this is an ongoing project that we just began. Uh, if you look at the, if you go to the author skills page, there is a web bibliography. And if you look in that web bibliography, you will find brief annotated links to uh, resources that help you choose what journal, how to deal with the publishing process. So maybe that is a way of finding some useful resources. Also, the Author Aid website has a vast library of resources. And if you were to go in there, you might see a, a category on waivers. You might see a category on uh, how to submit papers and things like that. So again, I defer to that, okay? Uh, how can Research for Life get waivers, discounts to publish in Elsevier, Emerald, 
And I think that's up to the individual publishers. It's not something that we can suggest to a publisher, oh, please grant access because this person is a participant from Research for Life. Unfortunately, that's outside the scope that we deal with, but it's still a good question. Of course. Emerald waivers can be checked here. Thank you, Domiziana. Do, do any of the others have anything to add about uh, waivers, discounts? Uh, I don't think we sufficiently answered that question or really gave you good ideas. Okay, Elsevier has waivers here. Okay, so you have to do your homework. Thank you, Domitiana. When are you going to start MOOC? Five weeks training. Uh, we don't have a date set yet, but in the first quarter of 2021, we will be uh, having the MOOC again, and maybe we will publicize it as best we can. I know that we've done a good job in trying to alert people. It does run five weeks. Uh, another thing we're doing this year, for those of you who are librarians, is uh, we are actually trying to set up some virtual master trainer courses. And for those of you that are up in the middle of the night, we're planning to have several in Asia on your time zone. We're contacting some people who may be able, from your region, who may be able to take this uh, care of this course. If you're interested in this virtual master trainer course, you have to take the MOOC first so that we're comfortable with you having a certain level of knowledge and background information. But we'll be sending out more information about that early in 2021. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, there's news about the MOOC. Domitiana put the link in there so you can go in and look directly. But there's no dates for 2021. Okay, thank you, Lucy. Can there be any plan for training, training for refreshment? You mean by refreshment means like uh, additional learning. So I do know you, Gita, and I would suggest that uh, I think you've been through the MOOC, so I would suggest uh, when we are able to have a uh, a course in Asia that is on your time zones. Uh, you could say, I've already registered, I've already completed the MOOC, so please consider me for this master trainer course because there's gonna be a lot of hands-on activity in that, okay? There we go. Thanks for the response. I, I wanted to add uh, one thing. I, I think that we have a lot of librarians from registered institutions. <laughs> And I just want to let you know that if you are having problems because your campus is closed and your users cannot access and you don't feel comfortable giving out the password, if you are having COVID-related problems because your campus is closed, contact us and we will try to find a solution for you and your users. Oh, invite any of your members to come to Kenya and facilitate a training workshop. How do I go about that? Uh, right now, the pandemic doesn't enable us to travel and do workshops. And we're also kind of shifting gears to doing things more virtually. So I would encourage, uh, you, uh, it's Alicia, to get the training by taking the MOOC, by becoming a master trainer, and by getting the skills to do the training yourself at your workshop, at your institution. Uh, that's kind of the direction we're going, and it seems to be, well, I think it's cost effective. We seem to uh, uh, getting a lot of people trained uh, through the MOOC. And uh, also, I think in this, until the pandemic has settled down and people have vaccines, uh, 
it's a little compli it's very complicated to travel. Although I have to admit, I miss doing face-to-face -face workshops. I hope that answers that. Yes, there are Aware colleagues in Nairobi. Thank you, Kim. Perfect idea. Contact them, perhaps they could uh, work with you to do some training. That's a great idea. But uh, we encourage people to get trained themselves so that they have the skills. And I, I guess I could mention that when we did the first master trainer virtual course, uh, we could see the kinds of questions, the kinds of knowledge that the people participating had was, was very high. And we were, in fact, there were a couple of times we had to say, well, we'll get back to you. Let us look up the answer to your question. So, uh, okay. Can you do self-study by watching recorded videos and do the test and exam? Uh, we don't have that option in there yet. Let me, okay, can you write, uh, if you write me directly and let me put my, maybe I'll put my, ooh, I can put my email address in. And I think we have to discuss that one after the course here. Because I have to, we have to think about if there's an option. Okay, here we go. Here's my email. Yeah, though sometimes it's frustrating and people cannot finish the course because of bandwidth issues, because of work responsibilities, uh, because of the pandemic. So we do understand that. Okay. Okay, so thank you. Uh, do we have any one more final question or not? Or because uh, we're getting up to an hour. Okay, Twitter, Facebook. Here's ways of communicating with us. Questions, is that what we're doing? Yeah. Okay. I don't know which one of us closes the meeting, <laughs> closes the webinar, but we are, uh, our time is up. Mitziana, you want to say a couple of things or should um, I just finish? Sure. I mean, I can reiterate the couple of things that I just put in the chat. So there's a lot of links for you to stay in contact. Um, I've also put in the chat links to the training portal, our webinars page, and all the information that Maria and Lenny shared during the webinar. Again, as a reminder, slides and recording will be up on our website. And, you know, when the recording is available, feel free to pass it on to your colleagues, maybe librarians at your, at your institution. I think it's really important that, um, you know, as many, as many people as possible have access to this. So feel free to pass on um, this recording. And I just want to thank all of you for being here. I know for some of you, it's early morning. For some of them, it's probably later in the, in the evening. So I really appreciate that you all took the time to be here with us. And especially thank you to Maria and Lenny for, for all your expertise. Yeah. We have, how long will it take before we get the recorded presentation? Um, it should be up in a... Yes, sorry, I need, uh, maybe a day or so. Where yeah, you... it's fast. And I encourage all of much. you, <clears throat> for questions that we didn't answer or for more information, go, <clears throat> go to the Research for Life training portal, explore there. You may find uh, information that's useful, tools that are useful in training, uh, the other we webinars. And so also to the, frequent, to the frequent asked questions in our web that we try to keep uh, updated, you will find a lot of answers to your questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Are we able to sign off here? Thank you. Everybody have a thank you. Thank you. Good evening you. and productive day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.